And welcome to another edition of the Let's Go Ricky Roll podcast. I'm Bethel Duran alongside with the man, Ricky Romero. Ricky, I know normally would be, let's see, it's May. We would probably be in Fiji at your other house right now, right? But we're still stuck in Southern California. How you doing? How you holding up? Good, man. Good. Um, ready for today's episode. Uh, it should be a fun one. Um, you know, we're just hanging in there. Just trying to... Uh, Hopefully, uh, get some sports back. I, I think slowly, you know, I think uh, the governor said that June 1st he's targeting now. So a little different than yeah. what he said a couple of weeks ago. So, you know, hopefully uh, it starts moving along and we start getting some sports on TV. Everyone misses that. So we'll see. Yeah. No doubt. Be, uh, it's a bunch of different things, you know, working in sports, you hear what's going to happen and you hear things one day and you hear things another day. But what we do know is if you're watching on YouTube, we appreciate you. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast. And if you're listening on iTunes or Spotify, go and leave that rate and review. Let us know what you're liking about it because the podcast is just growing and moving and we're hooking you up the fan. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see Ricky's hat, that West Side Love, and you see that shirt over my hat side, and I also got the hat. West Side Love is hooking us up, and by us, we mean you, the listener, the viewer. Go to their website or go to their Instagram, West Side Love. Uh, you check them out and use the code Ricky Dash Row, Ricky Dash Row, and you'll get 15% off shirts, hats, they got some hoodies, all kinds of good gear. Uh, and I kept joking last week, I put on my Instagram, remember it's like, it's not an ad, it's not an ad. People were like, it's an ad. I'm like, no, it's not. Like, we're not getting money out of it. But enough people have been asking us, dude, where are you getting the sweet gear from? And we're like, dude, let's do something to hook up the listener and the viewer. So Ricky Dash Row, you get 15% off, Rick. That's cool. It's pretty cool. And like I said, the the we've, we've gotten a chance to interact with the with the guy who owns it, and he's been awesome. Um, I oh, like you it. have? I've never I met told, him. Okay, look at you. Like I told him, I was like, hey, man, I came across across you guys just by an ad, and I love the logo, and boom, I support you guys. You know, West Coast, you know, it's, it's, it's awesome. You know, check it out. Yeah, and we have been practicing social distancing. I haven't seen Ricky in a while, but I've gone to his driveway, and what do I drop off every single week, Rick? Some craft beer, man. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. craft beer kings my dude mo and mike salam they keep sending me beer right and the beer is for the podcast guest so craftbeerkings.com when you, if you ever go to the store in Monty, tell mo that i sent you that ricky sent you and they will hook you up with a couple extra cans so i went the other day and i got all kinds of beer right now right like they loaded me up i'm like don't know what to do so every week Mo, I am dropping off the beers to Ricky. He is hooking it up. He's all set up. They're backed up. They will ship all over the country. Another, not commercial, but they're hooking you up. So I sent some to my friend in Atlanta the other day. I sent some to different people. So craftbeerkings.com. And it sounds like we're signing up with a bunch of different commercials. But it's not. It's just we're just hooking up the good people. But, yeah, this one came out. He sent this bomber right here. Belching Beaver in San Diego. All right. That's it. Let's get going. Ricky Romero, today's guest is a dude that probably isn't old enough to drink, right? He's a youngster that you've known for a couple of years. Yeah, yeah. I think I'm. A, I'm. I don't. I'm not sure if I'm a little frozen or not, but I don't know if you can you hear me. Yeah, we just keep on talking. Just keep on talking. Okay. Okay. Yeah, man. I mean, uh, our guest. I, yeah, he probably. I'm not sure he's old enough to drink. In Canada, he is. <laughs> but um you know our guest mike soroka i got to meet him last year in, at dodger stadium it was actually pretty funny because uh the trainers that are there with the atlanta braves were the trainers in toronto when i was there george pulis and mike frost at and I, I went to go see them and george came up to me he's like hey man there's actually a kid here who grew up a blue jays fan and big fan of yours and uh and yeah, and his name's Mike Soroka. And I was like, wait, what? You know, are you kidding me? That's pretty cool, you know? And 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 I already knew who he was, obviously. Uh, the kid was dominating at that point and continued to dominate the rest of the year. So uh, yeah, I mean, he was, uh, they said he was, George is like, don't, don't worry. Just, you know, he might be a little shy. And I'm like, nah, man, nah, nah, nah. So, you know, that's how we met and kind of we built a little bit of a relationship and now he's our guest here on the Let's Go Reggae Roll podcast. Yeah, Mike up, Soroka. John? Mike, let, okay. let me let, say, how do you say your name, Mike, just so we can get it right? Last name? Soroka. Yes. Soroka. And right now, I am going to apologize. Yesterday, I sent a tweet 
you know, I'm an honorary Canadian. Mike Soroka, Calgary, Alberta, Canada. I apologize to your dad, Gary, because I'm so used to the, the Ontario because my, my people in Toronto, you my t- Toronto passport. So it's Calgary, Alberta. Mike Soroka, how are you doing? Welcome to the show. I'm good, guys. Thank you for having me. I'm uh, just kicking it here in Atlanta, waiting for uh, things to get going here. All right, so Ricky told the story about how you guys met at Dodger Stadium last year. How did that come up for you, Mike? Yeah, it was good. I, uh, like I said, I don't, I don't think I knew he was there. Uh, I think George Poulos kind of brought me aside um, and told me that there was someone there that he wanted me to meet. And I, you know, when people pull you over in BP, usually it's like friends or family that are, are standing on the lines. But uh, I saw him from a distance, and I, I think I was. I was smiling the whole way there because, um, I mean, yeah, I grew up a Blue Jays fan. And then right when I started watching, um, would have been some of Ricky's best years in Toronto. Um, I won, when my dad and I won a trip from Home Run Sports to go watch the Blue Jays in 2010. Um, so he, he might have a better recollection than I do about that year. But that was kind of when I first really got into baseball and, and he would have been uh, one of the pitchers that I was watching at the time. So he, uh, I think Ricky's trying to figure out his audio, but we'll get to him right now. So you say you grew up watching him now, Calgary, and Ontario, not next to each other. Right. But was Ricky that guy? He was your one. That's the one you were watching. <laughs> um, I, I have to be honest here um, because the person that, that really got me into pitching, I, I would say would have been Roy Halladay right when he was going from the Blue Jays to the Phillies. Um, so he was he was kind of the one to watch, and I think everybody would agree. I think Ricky was probably watching him, too, when they, when they first started playing together. Um, but, no, I mean, it was, uh, it was a fun time because there was I – mean, I'm trying to go back on names, but Brandon Morrow was another one that I like to watch, uh, especially when he had his stuff. He was one of those guys that um, – you know, his stuff kind of came and went, but when he had it, he was one of the most fun guys to watch too. And um, like I said, I, I think probably my love of pitching came from watching guys that actually pitched like Ricky. Now, uh, I think Ricky uh, will say this. He told me about it last year when he, like, he came back into the group chat. He's like, dude, there's a kid who came up to me at Dodger Stadium because he was there. I think Ricky was just like the, watching and hanging out. In the, uh, you know, he's officially retired. And then in the group chat, he comes back and he's like, there was this kid, Mike Soroka, who I was told that he knew who I was. He's like, I used to watch you pitch. He goes, I feel old now. But that, all right, for the people who don't know, because Ricky, as you know, that Ricky's like one of the most humble persons you'll ever meet. When in his heyday, your kid in Calgary and, you know, with Halliday and Brandon Moore and all those other guys, Ricky was the man, right? That's who you guys were watching? 100%. Yeah, I think Ricky uh, will say this. He told me about it last year. Okay, so we got the feedback. So I think we gave Ricky back. But that's he was the guy you were watching. So your story. You grew up in Calgary, baseball guy, hockey guy. Which was your first love? Oh, hockey. It's Yeah, it's not even close. Um, I We played baseball as a summer, you know, getaway from hockey, basically. I remember – it was only, you know, a couple months of our summer just because it was, uh, you know, getting ready for hockey season as soon as school started, really. Um, you know, we were in hockey camps as of August. So, really, if baseball started in June, July, and then you have August off. Um, so, it was, it was considered almost more of a hobby. And I know we had some uh, uh, hockey coaches that joked about that, too. But, um I think part of my love for baseball came from the fact that I was always allowed to just go out and play. Um, I didn't have any of that associated pressure with baseball because, um, you know, even to a certain extent, a lot of our coaches were learning the same as us. They had Hmm. either watched baseball or they were fans of baseball, but they weren't exactly into it as much as, you know, a lot of youth coaches down here. Um, you see that all the time down here now. You see how serious it is, and that's how hockey is back home. So I think with baseball, I was allowed to go out and play, and that's why when it came decision time when I was about 14, um, I think it was pretty obvious because I, I like to play baseball so much more. And hockey-wise, you were the goalie, right? I was, and that, I honestly, at the end, that's probably why I ended up uh, choosing baseball because 
I fell out of love with practicing as a goalie. Uh, so much of being a goalie depends on your movement around your crease. So literally your, your practices would just be a four by six crease. And uh, it just got boring for me. So um, that's, again, it didn't matter what I was doing with baseball. I was hitting, fielding, pitching. Uh, I always wanted to be there and I, I loved every minute of it. So uh, that's probably why I gave up hockey. Okay, so you're 14 years old and you're like, okay, dad, I'd rather do baseball because I don't want to wake up early to go to the pond. I don't want to go to the rink. I don't want to do this. Like, when you go and you say something, you're like, I'd rather do that. In Calgary, if you're choosing baseball over hockey, what's the reaction? Um, I think, well, most people think that it's just that you weren't good enough to play hockey. Um, <laughs> so I, but my dad knew, and I think he kind of, was more reaffirming than anything else to me. And he, I, I don't want to say he made the decision for me cause I made the decision, but yeah. Uh, when we started talking about, listen, if you want to compete at a high level on, in either of these sports, you're going to need to start putting in the time that, you know, those kids that you're trying to compete yeah. with are putting in. Um, and especially at that time I, I hadn't grown yet. Uh, I was waiting, I was waiting for my, my height and weight to come on. Um, so I, it really was a time when, you know, I had to kind of look at things and I think he kind of said, you know, I've always seen you with a smile on your face at baseball. I've always seen you uh. get out of the car, excited to be there. Um, excited to see your buddies at baseball. He said, you didn't, after a certain point, you weren't excited to go to hockey or, you know, he'd ask if I wanted to go to, to goalie lessons. And I, it was more of like, a I guess I have to kind of thing. Um, mm. So that was again, pretty easy. And he made that, uh, he made that decision very easy on me because he wanted me to do what I enjoyed. Um, so it, it moved very smoothly. I mean, it's when it becomes a chore at whatever age, it doesn't matter. You don't want to do it. Whether you're 34 or 14, you're just like, man, I don't want to do this. All right. So now you go and you say, you know what? I'm playing baseball. All right. You see this in Atlanta, Southern California, United States, there's kids that are playing eight, nine games a, a weekend at the age of eight, you know, with the travel ball circuit and everything else. Calgary at 14, what's the baseball scene like there? So I got really lucky to be able to join a program um, ran by Jim Lawson and um, a couple of pitching coaches that had, had been uh, in either professional baseball or, you know, as Chris Reitzma spent seven years in the big leagues. Um, they were – they were there and that was an obvious choice for me to join that program. And it was, although it was a year round program, of course we only played games from April through October, really um, as weather permitted uh, in those end months. But it was so much more developmental than I think a lot of kids down here get down here. It's almost so focused on being at the top level, every single level you're playing at, Everything's about velocity. Everything's about, um, you know, teaching kids just mechanics and everything to the point where it just waters down the actual game of it. Um, and again, that's why I say I got to love doing it. Um, I still love being able to take ground balls uh, because those are the days where I went to the field house after school with a buddy and it was just us in there and we were able to you know, hit live hit line drives at each other, or um, I'd throw them a flat ground, vice versa. Um, and we just got to play. And I think that's where things really started to take off for me. Yeah, part of the thing is, you know, you just want to play. You want to have fun. At the same time, when did you say, you know what, I'm actually pretty good at this. I think there might be a future. Um, it also, I guess it all started, I guess, sort of in 2013. Um I had grown a lot height wise that year. Um, I think going into going to my 10th grade year, I was like six foot two and the year before it was like five, foot five or five foot six. So I, I'd grown a ton. Yeah. I'd grown a ton. And obviously I was a little gangly. I was only about 145 pounds, but uh, I velo went up. It felt like every month I was throwing harder and harder. And, you know, I didn't believe my dad when he telling me that I was throwing harder than, you know, all the older kids at the field. Um, 
you know, I thought that was just something that dads say uh, yeah. to get your confidence up. But once I kind of got out there at a Alberta top 40 tryout, uh, I think I hit like 87 or something. And uh, that's when it kind of hit me that, oh, man, that's pretty hard. You know, <laughs> like that's, <laughs> that's coming in pretty good. And that, at the time, I think it was only 15. Um, and then it all, all came down to being in the weight room and, and getting stronger and getting bigger um, pulling some things out, but really, I think that's when it started to take off that, okay, I think I have what it takes to, to be able to play collegiate baseball. Um, and really that was the only focus for a while was because anytime you can get money to go get an education, um, and get an experience to play at a, at a pretty cool school for four years, I think that's a win. So for a while, that was our only thing. And then it sort of been the year before my draft or even just in after I had signed my letter of intent to go to University of California, Berkeley. I went into the off season with a, uh, a trainer named Chris Osmond, who's now the, uh, he's the head physical strength guy for um, the Philadelphia Flyers hockey team. And I basically said, they know I can, they know I can pitch a little bit. They know what I have, but eventually I'm going to need to throw harder. And to do that, we're going to need to get more explosive and get bigger. And if it happens, it happens. And it, it did. I got, I got lucky. I kind of came into a little extra velo right before the draft. And, um, you know, the Braves made an offer. I, I couldn't pass up. And we are back. Sorry for the confusion, the technical difficulties. I tell you, when Ricky lives all over the world, we have so many numbers for him, but he is back. Ricky, we continue to roll. Soraka's just giving us the details, bro. Like Calgary, he's the man throwing 87 when he's 6'2", shooting up. He's the he like stretched out. You back, Rick? Yeah, I'm back. I'm back. I can hear you guys. All right, all right. So when you uh, yeah. when you saw a kid from Calgary talks to you and tells you, "Hey, I'm going here. I'm doing this in major leagues." As a player who who uh, made his name in Toronto, it's pretty cool to see these young kids coming through the country, right? Make a name for themselves in the United States, Rick. Oh, for sure, man. Yeah, I think, and for me, you know, I think you grow playing there and, and you know, obviously getting to know the Canadian culture and all that. You get to see, hear and see a lot of these guys or hear more hear about them because, like I told you yesterday through text, Canadians are really proud about their Canadian, Canadian athletes, especially when they get to the, you know, whether they're Olympians, uh, big leaguers, NBA guys, they're all over the, the, the news there. And they do a good job of uh, of uh, making sure they get the right platform and 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 people get to know them before they even get to the big league. So, um, you know, I think that's one thing they do really, really well out there. Uh, they're just, you know, really proud people. Like I said, nobody sings a, a national anthem like they do. And, uh, you know, Mike, Mike will be the first one to tell you that. And, um, yeah, I mean, it's like it, it's always cool when, when you get to see these guys. You know, you see the – when Larry Walker just got in, in, uh, in, in to, into the Hall of Fame this year, he, uh, you, you could see all these guys tweeting about him and the, the genuine love that they have for this guy. And, and that's just goes for like everyone that puts on a, a Canadian jersey, I feel like. And Mike, oh, yeah. well, representing your country, how much honor and pride do you have in that? That was cool. Um, Again, that's another experience that you kind of go through, especially on the junior team when you're 15, 16, 17. Uh, and your main focus is going to college, but you don't have you don't have quite a sense of what it means to actually play for your team, especially in baseball. Uh, or Sorry, play for your country, because that's not an opportunity that you get too often in baseball, uh, and especially to play with, you know, the best of. Um, I know Bryce Harper had said it on the uh, Starting Nine podcast uh, that he wishes that, you know, we were good to go to the, the Olympics. And um, hockey did that for years. And that was by far and away the most watched game, at least in Canada. I, I, there's no doubt about it. Um, we're always more proud when we come together as a country. And I think that that comes into to everything. Um you know, Baseball Canada is such a close-knit program uh, that, you know, so much, so much of us know each other. And, you know, like I, I good buddies with uh, Ricky Romero's first roommate when he was with the Blue Jays, Scott Richmond. 
uh, we were talking about <laughs> earlier. Uh, um, you know, Canadian baseball, it, it kind of kept it tight, and uh, he's been amazing to them as well. He's he's always been around, and he's been with the senior team for a long time too. So uh, it's examples like that that we try and follow and, uh, you know, keep it alive. Yeah, and, and, and like I said, Beto, I think it's it's genuine love in between between these guys, and you can see that they're always rooting for each other. I'm not saying that other countries don't do that, but you just see the love, that the passion that they have. Obviously, it's a big deal when they beat the U.S. in anything, you know, and, and you know, you see the U.S. is always superior supposed, in, in different sports, supposedly, you know, but, you know, Canada is always there, and especially in hockey. I remember watching that game in spring training, and it was actually Scott Richmond and Adam Lowen who were the only Canadians on the team. And, oh, yeah. Uh, and we had a big, big uh, gathering, and uh, Vernon Wells kind of set it up in spring training. And I remember watching that game, and those guys, you could hear a pin drop when uh, Crosby scored the goal in, at the end. And, um, yeah, and those two guys were, like, going crazy celebrating, and everyone was showering them with, like, we had, we had like little pucks and everyone was throwing pucks at them, like in a fun way. And those guys were just <laughs> loving it. The stage, they did a whole like gold medal ceremony. It was hilarious. It was hilarious. They rubbed it in our face as much as they could. And, um, but it was just funny, you know, it was, it was just the camaraderie that we, that, 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 that team had. And, you know, having those two guys uh, rooting for Canada was just, it was just funny because like I said, it's just, there's just such a big rivalry anytime they play in any sport, you know, whether it's, you know baseball hockey women's hockey it could be anything it's always canada us it's like oh us against you guys and it's it's, it's always a, a fun uh com competitive uh you know the competitive nature comes comes out but I, what I, I wanted to ask you mike um obviously calgary you know for for a lot of the listeners that are from the united states um you know i got to go there uh i think for the second time this past this year um yeah and i this this time i realized you know how big the you know how big they are into like eating meat you know and and i never realized that the first time that i went and and it's a big it's a big farming uh area right yeah alberta is um you know we say alberta beef we take pride in alberta beef um yeah. But, uh yeah no i mean just outside of calgary that's that's why people think um, you know, I, I always compare Alberta to kind of like a, a Texas with no guns, um, <laughs> just because it, it literally, it is two bigger cities between Calgary and Edmonton. Um, and then you have a couple smaller ones in Lethbridge and Medicine Hat, but, um, it really is those two big cities. And after that, if you go West, I guess you get Banff and then BC in the mountains, but it's, uh, it's, I mean, ranching and farming land. So. We take pride in that. We, uh, you know, we have the stampede there as well. So, um, I heard. I heard that's a big deal. Did, I mean, did you? I'm sure you've bought, you've been busy with baseball lately, but did you ever get a chance to to kind of experience that whole party stuff? Uh, not really. Um, the last times I'd been before I was legal, obviously, I'd been to, uh, I'd been either playing baseball, and then once I signed, uh, I was only 17 when I was drafted. So uh wow. legal age legal age up there is 18 um which by the way i'm 22 now so i am we got some stuff uh ironed out actually it was the all-star break two years ago after i'd been called up but i was on the aisle with um just got a couple shoulder issues and i was able to go home a day early before I was heading to Orlando to, to get to rehab. So um, I'd, I'd seen that, but I kept it pretty, uh, pretty low key. Yeah, so I'm, the I'm Calgary sure. Stampede, right? That's like the big thing. It's like the big rodeo. Everybody talks about it. Were you a cowboy growing up too, Mike, or what? Or just, all, just an athlete? No, not really. Um, <laughs> you know, there, there's certainly lots, and I think we take pride in it. And everybody's a cowboy for two weeks or cowgirl. <laughs> um, you know, two weeks when the stampede comes. Uh, but no, I, although I grew up on kind of the edge of the city, still much more of a city boy than anything else. So, Mike, you get you get you said you get drafted at the age of seventeen. 
did you were you I'm, I'm not sure if you guys got into this or not but were you prepared or did you have any idea of what you were getting into when you got drafted and now you're like all right I got drafted you were obviously a first rounder and then you get to the minor league part of baseball and were you just like was that eye-opening for you uh no just because uh baseball canada again with the junior team we get to play uh the minor leaguers in instructional league uh regular spring training and then again in uh extended spring training um so you're essentially sharing the complexes with them and if basically you get to live minor league life for a little bit um you, so you get a, you guys you get a pretty good yeah you guys got to play against the Toronto Blue Jays too, right? Minor leaguers. You guys would come in there every once in a while, right? Yeah, and then we actually play uh, the Baseball Canada Junior Team plays against the uh, as you do as a split squad team from the Blue Jays every spring at in Dunedin. So that's kind of a a tradition, and it's it's usually hit or miss depending on how the game goes. Uh, but they go out there and compete. Uh, it's fun for uh, it's fun for both sides, I think. Well, I mean, I guess that's pretty cool. And then, obviously, you're a T12 alumni. Um, I've heard that's, you know, I, I reached out to TJ Burden yeah. about you. We, we had a nice look at that. And, you know, he obviously had some tremendous things to say about you. But talk about that experience of going to the T12 and getting... Wait, what's uh, a T12? T12 is a tournament. Um, Mike will probably explain it better, but it's a tournament where they kind of get all the prospects from 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 all of Canada and they kind of make a oh, tournament okay. out of it. And it's kind of like yeah. a perfect game, but in Canada. Oh, okay. And it's hosted at the at the Rogers Center. Yeah. Yeah, that that was honestly uh previously I'd pitched with Alberta at the Canada Cup. So it was mostly guys from that same team. It was basically your best best kids from each province and then they had you know, they had a future stars team where they had kids that didn't make the provincial teams, but they were only like 15 come out and play. Um, so I, I still tell people this, and that was the most nervous I've ever been on the mound in my life because that was the first time on a big stadium. Um, it's the first time being out there basically under the lights because we had the, the roof closed. Um, and there wasn't too many people in there, but the people that were were scouts and um you know, college coaches and all that kind of stuff. And that's the first time that I'd ever really been in front of that type of, you know, that type of crowd that's making opinions on you. And they're going to be making decisions on whether they think you have a future in the game or not. So um, that one, that one hit me pretty good. And I'll, I'll say again, the most nervous I ever got was before the draft. And after that, it was all just go out and play. That's uh, pretty cool. Scott Richmond is actually watching us right now. Hey, Richmond, our number our first uh, <laughs> podcast guest, he's out watching. He's still throwing. You know, and I'm doing the research on you, Mike. You you hear about this stuff, and you know you got drafted. Uh, you're at home with your dad. You get drafted, and then you had to go and write a physics paper, and then but you overnight became a millionaire. Like your life completely changed. <laughs> and three years before that, though, you were still a hockey goalie. You're competing in an empty arena. When did you say, you know what, damn, like, what, what, like, it's got to be overwhelming. Ricky's told the story of his playing in the College World Series and realizing you're getting drafted like this. As uh, Ricky always said, these are life-changing moments that very few people understand. Did you understand at that age what was really going on? I think I did, and, and a oh. lot of that was because of uh, being able to talk to coaches that have been there. And I mean, Greg Hamilton with Baseball Canada too. I mean, we talk about it all the time and, and we have long talks and he really does a good job of kind of pushing life on you before it happens to really get you to understand that, you know, things are going to happen pretty quickly and, and you better be ready for them. So I think I was as ready for them as you could be. Uh, but I do remember right after getting drafted and, and still having to graduate and write a couple finals, <laughs> um, those two weeks being a little stressful, uh, just because again, everything was picking up so quickly and yeah, your life changed overnight, essentially, like you said. Um, so other, other than that moment though, I mean, once I got down, once I started playing, uh, and kind of fell into a schedule of everyday life, um, I, I think things pretty, pretty well moved pretty smoothly for me at least. Um, where, where did 
where did you think, did you think you were going to the Atlanta Braves or did you think you were going somewhere else? Uh, we knew there was a chance. We knew there was a chance basically starting at pick 27, um, which uh, the Rockies, the Rockies were picking at 27 and Mike, Mike Nickerak got drafted just ahead of me. And when I heard, I heard his name, but I heard Mike, we thought it was, we thought it was me. Uh, so that was, that was a bit of a spike and then a letdown. Uh, but then the next pick we knew, uh, we got the call from the Braves uh, right before the pick. Um, and I was actually on a bit of a delay on MLB.com because we don't, we can't get MLB network on TV, obviously. That's um, right. So like a minute after I think the pick had been made, and my phone was blowing up. I saw it on TV, um, but that was uh, that was one of those special moments. That's one of those ones that, uh, as prepared as you can be, you're not uh, at the same time. Um, but I'm, I'm glad I, I did it the right way, and we got to spend good time with family and friends in that situation, and and it was a good night. Yeah, and and I always talk about the the, the draft night for me, or the dra- It was during the day actually, and we huddled up around a little computer because back then we didn't have MLB network or there was no TV coverage about it. So you kind of just sit there and huddle up around a a computer that, that we had, that was in my sister's room. And I just remember that too. And it's a very emotional moment that you share, obviously everything you've worked hard for, you know, your dreams are close to becoming true. Uh, Obviously for me, I didn't know what it was going to be like. All right. I signed. And now I'm stuck in short season, Auburn, New York. And I'm like, what the hell this now, <laughs> this is a real introduction into pro ball. And, you know, a little, a lot of the stuff was eye opening and it took a little bit for me to get adjusted. And, uh, and what, what do you remember what pick the blue Jays had that year? I do. Sure, I picked I'm, 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 they were right I'm after sure they were, Oh, they were, they were right yeah, after they the were, Braves. But- we uh, we had gotten, I guess, call or intel that um, the Blue Jays were going to go a different direction during that pick. Um, whether they were or not, we have no idea, no way of knowing. Um, but it, it's, I mean, that, that situation is funny to go over because Anthopolis, who was the GM at that time in Toronto, is now with us. So we, we talk about that all the time. You should give them uh, shit over it. Be like, man, you you weren't you weren't going different direction. <laughs> well, it's, you know, it's just funny because there's so many different uh, there's so many different things that go on in draft year, like you know, but a lot of people yeah. don't realize for teams to make up their mind on a kid when they really only get to see him a handful of times and a handful of times in in good situations. Mm-hmm. Um, there's just so much so many opinions that, that go into it. And it, it's, it really is at that point, you're, you're choosing a 17 year old kid. You, you really don't know. Um, that's why a lot of, a lot of that advanced scouting comes in finding out who the person is, but there's just so much that goes into scouting that, um, you know, you, you just don't know. So that's a funny I'm one. Sure, I'm sure Blue Jay fans listening to this saying like, Oh, we wish we had, wait, what? They were going a different direction. If he was there, you mean we wouldn't have taken the hometown kid? They, 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 I'm sure they, that they, they don't, they don't like hearing that. <laughs> well, they had a pick, uh, they had a pick not too much later, like pick 40 something. Um, uh-huh. so I don't, I'm not, could have went there too, but, um, yeah. like I said, it was, it was awesome. And I was, uh, I was really, really happy to go to the Braves too because. At the time, that was our, our basically our first draft class after they kind of made it public that they were rebuilding. So to be uh, considered in that forefront of that rebuild was was a pretty cool thing. Yeah. It's interesting because the Blue Jays that year took uh, John Harris, a right-handed pitcher at a uh, Missouri State. So to go and say that they weren't, you know, still a pitcher. So there you're wondering right there. All right, let's, let's move on here because I know you got to get going. You got to work out. You got all kinds of stuff going on, uh, Mike Soraka. We figured it all out. Major League debut, where was it? How was it? Take us there. Uh, it was in New York on May 1st, two years ago. Um, well, before before you get into it, Mike, talk to us about the call-up, like when they when you're oh, yeah. in the minors and then they bring you in and talk about that moment. Obviously, you know, you're – from what I read, you're, you know, uh, Chris uh, Rietzma, right? Rietzma. 
big influence on you. Uh, your dad, uh, pretty much, you know, um, you know, you lost your mom at a young age and, uh, you know, it was you and your pops and obviously Reedsma came in and, and kind of took you under his wing. I know, um, you know, from what I read, you know, you got to share those moments, you know, with them. Talk about the emotional roller coaster of when you get called into the office. Uh, were you in double A or triple A? I was in triple A. Um, you were in Burnett. And talk about when you get called in and the first phone call and all that stuff that went on. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, it was, it was a bit of a lead up. Uh, and I don't really have a cool story like a lot of people. They had, you know, a prank played on them. Uh, but it really, it was the week before. I think there was a couple injuries on the big league staff. Um, and I'd been talking with Ritzma and then my dad, obviously, about the possibility of it happening sooner than, you know, we thought or expected. Um, and then I think in my next outing, I threw, it was a shortened game because we played seven inning double header. Um, I had Jose Bautista playing third and I think I threw a CG, uh, the seven inning CG. Um, okay. And then it was a couple of days after that, I kind of, I think, Damon Berryhill is our manager in AAA, and I think he found me. I think it was in the bathroom or something, and he kind of just said, hey, I want to see you for a second. And that's when that's when it starts rolling. Everybody knows when you're like, oh, man, like this could be it. Um, I had never really got any call-ups uh, throughout the minor leagues to another level because I was just one year, one level at a time sort of thing. Yep. Um, so that was kind of a – a rush to be in there. And then uh, the way they put it was basically, we're not sure what's going to happen, but you're going to get bumped for your next start. And you're either going to throw, I want to say it was a Friday night in, in New York for the Braves, or you're going to throw on Saturday for the Gwinnett Stripers. Um, <laughs> so it was kind of one of those moments where I wasn't exactly sure what was going on. Um, and I, I think I remember asking, like, okay, hold on. Tell me again <laughs> what the plan is. Um, and then making that call. And, and it was nice because it gave everybody a couple days to, to work their way down to New York because that's not an easy or cheap way to get, get to New York from Calgary, especially last minute like that. So for them to have two, two to three days to, to figure it out was awesome. And it, it allowed everybody to come down and, like I said, share those moments. But – Again, first call to my dad, and um, I remember him. I couldn't stop laughing on the other end of the line. Um, you know, I, I don't think I could either. I think, you know, those butterflies hit your stomach, and I don't think they left until after I had gotten on the mound at, at City Field. Um, it was those two or three days, and uh, it was long. But then second call to Ritzma, um, I mean – yeah, incredible. I mean, he, he he's one of those guys, he, I mean, he took the time um, just to come out and run pitching clinics in Calgary and then getting to work with him over and over again with Calgary, uh, the pro baseball force. Uh, I mean, he'd really been there every step of the way and he'd seen it from start to finish. Uh, and he's been one of the biggest parts of my life, really. And... Uh, to be able to experience that with him and uh, go from him being literally a, a hero and a mentor to being a friend and, and more of a, um, you know, being that brotherhood with him that he'd, yeah. he'd played major league baseball. And now all of a sudden I was in that, in that group as well. So, all right. So you make your debut in New York out of all cities. I mean, you <laughs> make your debut and where did you go eat after? I did, it was a while. Um, I didn't realize that uh, how things happened. I got my first win that night, so we had a, a few celebrations to be had in the dug or in the um, clubhouse. Uh, clubhouse after. And uh, after I got done with media and saw them and got to hang out with them for a minute, I think we—I don't even remember what it's called—but we found a bar somewhere in Midtown that was still open. We ordered a bunch of pizza and. and just hung out. It was a nice night. Um, it was probably the only night in 
a couple a couple nights in my career that I didn't really care what time I was going to bed at. Uh, <laughs> trying to spend that night, make it feel, uh, you know, kind of soak it in with those people that have been there the whole way. Yeah, I, uh, when, when I when I made my debut, we had a we had to fly that day because it was a getaway day. And I remember we got into Cleveland, and Roy Halladay hosted a dinner for the starters. So that was kind of my little introduction into a, a big league dinner, you know, hosted by him and, and the rest of the starters of the pitching staff. So that was pretty cool at that moment. Yeah. You know, obviously, Doc wasn't one guy that usually went out and, 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 and invited you to dinner or anything like that. But I feel like that day he, he took the whole staff. So that was pretty cool. Yeah, Mike, uh, stay on the theme of your for big league debut. You're in New York. A kid, as you said, from the outskirts of Calgary, who's, you know, the big city for you was when the Stampede comes in, everybody there. New York City, like, what city field? It doesn't matter if it's sold out or not. Just the lights, everybody doesn't stop. Afterwards, what was that moment like with your dad, who had been taking you to practices for all those years and everything else and your family in that moment? Uh, that was a cool one uh, to see him. Um, probably more nervous than I was. Um, I don't think either of us ate too much. And then, um, you know, my stepmom Leanna was there with him as well. And, and I think she was, she was a lot cooler because this is just what I did. Um, but him, I think, I think it hit him a little differently than it hit me. Uh, cause Ricky can attest to this. I think when you get in, involved and so wrapped up in your process, um, things don't seem like they happen that fast because you're living it and you're, you're going through it every single day. Um, so for me, it was just kind of, you know, this is the next progression and uh, here we go. You know, this is my spot and, yeah. and you know, let's go. So mm -hmm. I think obviously a little more excited and nervous that day than, than most days in the minor leagues. Um, and then you really get a good sense when you step on that mound, how real games feel all of a sudden. Um, and then if you have to go back and pitch in AAA, which I did uh, last year and then when I was hurt as well, um, those games feel like exhibition games all of a sudden, especially after you make that debut in New York. Um, PA system's booming. Um, you know, you got Cespedes. For the most part, it kept the crowd pretty quiet until Cespedes hit a solo shot off me in the – fifth or the sixth and uh that's when i was like oh there they are <laughs> <laughs> okay rick you told me about him like last year you said when you met him at dodger stadium you'd be like this kid has a cool presence about him super nice and you're talking 22 like you you might be the youngest guest we've had but you also might be the coolest like chill guest we've had because you're pitching in the major leagues at 20 and you're like yeah, you know, you just go out there, whatever. Like, where does this, like, demeanor come from? We're all Canadians like this. What the hell, man? Well, and I think I think he explained earlier where he said, you know, a lot of the stuff in the play, the, the Canadian uh, junior team comes and plays against the minor leaguers. So I think it prepares them for that big time. And Dude, I, but I'm he's just, 20 in the major leagues, bro. Like, he's oh, 20. Some, they just breed him differently in Canada, man. That's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> I, oh, hell. I mean, we like to say we do, um, but to me, I think it, it goes back to playing a game that you love um, because a lot of people say this and being able to be nervous and anxious to go out there. But as soon as, as soon as you're out there, it kind of switches. Um, you know, I think it all, really also did help being out there and having to face Cindergard at the plate first. Um, you know, we, we hit nine through him. I was the last out of that first inning. Um, but to be at the plate first and kind of have to figure it out there, it felt like just kind of another inning to go out. Um, and I, I always explain this to people. It's one of the most, one of the things I'm most proud of um, in my career, my life is how many times you roll that pitch over in your head before it happens. <laughs> Um, you know, it could be the first pitch of, of the playoffs, uh, first pitch of your debut. You're imagining all the lights, all the people, uh, who's in the box. Um, and you're just imagining executing that first pitch. You know, I, I remember saying 
when I was like 15 and I, my head got a little big cause I was throwing 87. I said, my first pitch in the big league is going to be like 102. Um, you know, but it switched from that to just executing a pitch. I want to execute my first pitch and, uh, going back on video and watching kind of how I was able to go on the mound and take it slowly and literally just execute that down and away pitch for strike one. Uh, I did that and that my confidence shot through the roof. Um, Cause if you can execute that first one, um, it's, it's go time from there. So uh, I think it's just thing, playing a game. I think one of the things I've always admired about watching him and I, the chances I've gotten on TV, it's how calm his demeanor is. He's just really calm yeah. in control. You can never, he never gets high. He never gets low. It's always just like such a nice and easy demeanor. I mean, it's what a lot of, you know, as a pitcher, you kind of hope you can, you can maintain that. And he see, I mean, you see, you saw him in the playoffs too. And it was just like a, Oh, here we go. It's just, a, it's just another game. I'm going to go out there and I'm going to do what I know what to do. I'm not going to get, let the situation get the best of me. And uh, yeah, I mean, you just see it. And, and um, I wanted to ask you, Mike, first time, the first showbird story. You, you jump on that uh, big league plane. What was your first, your thought process? Obviously, when I was coming up, it was, you know, you get on the plane last because you're a rookie. You do certain things on the plane where you maybe you get beers or drinks or uh, food for some of the guys. Did they make you do any of that? What was your first experience like when you walk into that team plane? Uh I don't, I don't know if I remember doing anything, uh, you know, I, I might've had to grab the speaker, the boom box or something. Uh, and yeah. sometimes I did that for Julio anyways, cause he had, he had a couple bags with him or something. Um, but you know, I, I remember my team flight, my, my first rookie year, I guess were a little different because we had a ton of guys that were just inherently quiet. Um, so for the most part, I, I went and sat at the back. I made sure nobody's, it was nobody's designated seat. Um, you know, I, I passed all the nice big lazy boy recliners and um, went back to basically where the media sits. Um, and really, it was it was a quiet flight. Um, when not not too much happened, but I, I think I think it was. What about that walking flight. onto that plane though? The first time you're like, wait a minute. This yeah. Is cool. Yeah. No, it, it's cool. It's it's cool. I, I don't even think I got security checked because they have the random security checks for us. And usually the first person on there that's on a new flight, you know, that you're, you're brand new on the manifest, you're usually getting checked, but I didn't. And so I was getting, I think I got the gears given to me because, uh, you know, somehow I skated by that too, but, um, you know, it was, it was definitely a cool one. And, and those flights are, uh, they're tough not to get used to because it's a different world and uh, traveling, <laughs> traveling's a different beast in the big leagues. You know what? Times have changed. Definitely. Scott Richmond writes beers for everyone. Every time Ricky, come on now. What do you <laughs> it, it's different. Times have changed. We forget though. Rick, he was a rookie a year and a half ago. It's like completely different. Times have changed. Guys don't have to get dressed up anymore. We are now sounding like the old man right now. And I think, think about it. He's, 22, I'm going to be 42, so this guy could be my kid. So you know, this is now officially, Beto is sounding like the old man in this. And I think anybody who's listening to right now will be like, man, if my kid was this mature at the age of 22, I've done a great job. So Gary, your dad, a great job raising you. We got some pictures to show you right now, uh, young Mike Soroka. This is the picture uh, our guy, John, back at the studio is just going to throw him up there. So, John, whatever you have, throw right. him up. I just want to see your reaction. Oh, yeah, look, this at that. look at that front hit. <laughs> where's this at guy. who is this that's good actually you know what you know what's funny the uh the kid playing first base behind me his last name's uh romeo he's from uh from venezuela javi uh they were a good good family we played with them for a long time but um man I, like that was with calgary west little league um and uh probably right after i'd been to read some of his pitching camps for the first time. And it was all about, you know, point that back pocket to, to your target and stay closed and then let it rip. So uh, that lean is, uh, I come by, honestly, it's something I still do today. All right. Smooth. smooth. What else we got, John? What's that? Who's this stud? 
Yeah. I don't know what we're doing with the hair there, but um, <laughs> that's, uh, that's when that's when you really fall in love with with being a goalie as a kid when you get brand new gear. That looks pretty new to me. Um, or at least that season was brand new gear. So uh, wanted to show all that stuff off. It's always fun to get the pads. Um, Look at that. That's, nice uh, tape job, too. That looks smooth right there. Like every looks, Canadian looks, kid has a picture of him playing hockey, right? It's got to be a rule. It's got to be, yeah. I mean, most athletes, right? That's that's what you gravitate to, and I think that's why uh, you don't see too many baseball players, especially from that side of Canada, because the athletes are just wrapped up in hockey, and their opportunities are sent to them. I remember we had a kid, a couple of kids come out 14, 15 years old, throwing mid-80s, but they are going to go to the Western Hockey League, and their shot was better with baseball, they figured, so... It's kind of just uh, you miss out on a lot of the athletes. And, Ricky, uh, you've had some fans that love you. Oh Ritzma is a fan favorite. What's going on here? <laughs> <laughs> Halloween. Um, we wanted to do lumberjacks, but we wanted to spice it up a little bit, apparently. Um, maybe sh show off the uh, the hard work from the gym, maybe. Um, yeah. That's, <laughs> that's what's going on there. So what do you do? Leg day every day? Uh, for a while, yeah. Um, you know, I think uh, it might have been that off season that we were doing uh, basically full body every, I guess it would have been four days out of the week. Um, and uh, yeah, man, I, I fell in love with that stuff. I, I was a bit of a meathead for a while. And then uh, after I got hurt, I learned I, I had to be a little different with it. Uh, now I'm learning what I can and can't do. Um, but it, it's all part of it. Mike, yeah, and Rick, I don't know. Oh, I was going to say before, I know you got to run soon, but I just kind of wanted to ask you about that first All-Star experience. I got to do yeah. it once, definitely once. Hopefully you get to do it for a long time. Do we have another one? Oh, there it is. The, there's the there it is. All-Star All game. How, how was that experience when you walk into that clubhouse and you see so many, uh, you know, stars and guys that you probably grew up watching how was how was that experience yeah. when, you, when you first walk in there yeah that was that was the crazy one um you know i always say playoffs were the best experience um but all-star was just different because like you said then you know it's kind of like showing up to your first big league clubhouse on spring training you know your first big league camp and you see the guy that you know, you've been watching coming up through the minor leagues, you know, Freddie was that guy for us. Uh, when you're actually sharing a clubhouse with Freddie Freeman, um, you know, that's that's kind of times 10 when you get to the All-Star game because now my locker's next to Freddie. And, uh, you know, he's talking to all the guys he's seen over the years. And, um, you know, he's talking like he's buddies with the Grom and all that kind of stuff. And, again, those are guys that, I watched and tried to take things from and uh, guys like Scherzer and Kluber when they were winning Cy Youngs and they were just trading, trading zeros year after year um, to be kind of in that same spot was probably honestly the first time in a long time where I almost questioned whether how, how I got there, um, <laughs> wow. you know, and that, that comes back to inherently trying to be confident, but uh, that was the first time that I was like, whoa, okay, this is a little different now. Because uh, these are guys, you know, you look at the patches on their jersey that tell you how many years they've been there. You know, Kershaw's was like his ninth or something like that. Um, and But that, that's what you associate the All-Star game with are those superstars. And, um, you know, that was that was a weird one, but well, awesome. Hopefully, hopefully we see many, many, many more out of you. I know uh, I, I'm good friends with your buddy, uh, Max Freed, and he wanted me to ask you. He said, hey, uh, what he ask him about his mid-workout snack during quarantine. He seem, he says he has the timing down perfectly. <laughs> I do. I do. Um, it's not a mid-workout. It, uh, it's kind of. I guess it's near the end. Um, you know, there's actually a lot to basically say how soon you have to eat right after you're done working out especially if you're doing something like squatting, deadlifting, where you're getting a, a really heavy response from your body. Um, basically, the, the sooner you eat, the more you fuel what was just broken down. 
And so near the end of my workout, I get the oven going and I, I lost some weight. I kind of go up and down. So I, I go in a bit of a fluctuation period and I, I needed to put on weight. So I was doing uh, chicken wings and tater tots uh, oh, <laughs> and, you know, midway through the workout, I go get the oven warm, throw those in. So as soon as I was done, I could throw those down and, uh, man, it, it's, it paid off. I put on, uh, I put my weight back on pretty quick. Yeah. That's what happens when you're 22 protein and carbs with tater tots and chicken wings. Rick, you got a, a Vega brand, uh, bar and a shake. And this dude's got freaking tater tots. Yeah. I'm over here, uh, trying to be uh, plant based as much as I can and trying to lose <laughs> some weight. This guy's trying to put on weight with chicken wings and tater tots. No. Yeah, it's, uh, it goes in. It goes in. It goes in a big circle, I guess. Uh, yeah, it's, yeah, it's called metabolism. You still have it. We don't. Don't worry about it, young man. All right, don't worry. <laughs> all that Calgary beef is gonna catch up one day. I know you got to go get your uh, tater tots and wings ready for your workout as you're in Atlanta. Final thing we uh, <laughs> like to leave you with, um, and it's kind of weird because usually we ask, "What would you tell your 18 year old self?" The best advice. Usually we get these salty vets on the show, but not today. Right now, a kid who is, say, 14 years old, hasn't quite clicked for him. What's the best advice for a kid who wants to grow up and be you? Uh, Ian, this is a hard one. It's kind of general. Um, but, you know, I think one of the things that was always hardest for me um, was expectations and constantly comparing myself to others. And in a, in a way, it needs to happen because you need to understand – what one guy has that you don't, what, what separates you from him and vice versa. Um, but I do think I gave myself more stress than it was worth putting things in a situation where I needed to be constantly, like I said, it overconfident or sorry, over competitiveness was one thing. Um, but realizing a little earlier that I, I could do what I could control and compete with myself and I didn't need to kind of be that, you know, edgy competitor that everybody thinks you need to be, to be at the top level. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's, there's nothing wrong with watching a guy go out there that you're competing with and wishing well for him and, and wanting to see him do good as opposed to, you know, always worrying about what others are doing. Uh, and like I said, that that's tough when you first get drafted and then there's so many good players um you get there and you're just like he throws hard he throws hard he's got a good curveball you know it's there a dime a dozen and and you start to see that and you start to maybe question a little bit with yourself if you belong um but the year i finally stopped thinking about what others were doing and working out about how i needed to get better and how i needed to compete with myself was when things started to take off and mm. wish i'd learned that a little earlier and it's, and it's real good said. advice it, it's it's a bit it's true what he says you walk into to spring training for the first time you in minor league camp and you're just like whoa this guy throws 100 that guy throws 100 this guy throws 97 with a nasty hammer on, and you're like whoa dude, dude, am i worth what they gave me and uh <laughs> do i belong here and, and 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 but you know the the day you start believing in yourself and the work ethic that you've developed I think that's where it all changes and that's where it changed for me. And it sounds like that's where it changed for, for Mike too. And it's very important, you know, but I think it's good that you get to see stuff like that. Just, you know, the, the best thing I always say, don't get complacent, you know, no matter yeah. how, how big a success you've ever had at the highest level, don't ever get complacent because there's always somebody below you working just as hard to try and get your, your, your spot. And that's just the way the baseball world is. There's five ro five spots in the rotation but there's a lot of guys that want one of those rotation spots. And that's why, you know, you, no matter the success, you got to just continue to, to, to push on forward. And, 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 but it's, it's true what he says, man, you, you start questioning a lot of things when you first walk into those uh, minor league camps, major league camps and all that stuff. It, without a doubt. <clears throat> and as always time to rock my Canada hat, uh, Rick <laughs> gave it to me for Vancouver. Appreciate it. Uh, 
Mike, real fun talking with you. We will talk to you in person whenever you come to L.A. We'll do this podcast uh, in person. Uh, we will give you probably a Molson, maybe, maybe some Crown Royal. One of those <laughs> Canadian beverages will take care of you. Uh, Ricky Romero, as always, appreciate you. As always, Mike, go get the workout. Tater tots and chicken wings. So if you want to go to the big leagues, tater tots and chicken wings. That's all you need, according to Mike Soraka, after, right? After you work out. After you work out. Oh, you got to work out. Then forget it. Forget it. If you got to yeah, work out, I, I don't need it. <laughs> but thanks a lot, Mike. Best of luck to you. We will talk to you soon. Calgary, Alberta, Canada's own Mike's Rocker. Ricky, I'll text you later. We'll talk to you soon. And as always, thanks for everybody listening to the Let's Go Ricky Roll podcast. Mike, thank you so much. We will talk to you soon. And everybody who listened, always go to uh, – Let's go Ricky Roll Podcast on iTunes, Spotify. Check it out. Rate, review, let us know. And on Wednesday, coming up, Joey Bats, Jose Bautista, is going to join the podcast. So for Ricky Romero, Mike Sorok, I'm Bethany Durant. Thanks for listening to Let's Go Ricky Roll. Let's go.